look, I'm getting these really funny heartbeats. Oh, that's anxiety. Other aspects of lifestyle which may be relevant. Be patient with yourself and just build up gradually. So I just needed to have them work with me. There's a whole bunch of cardiomyopathies. Benefits of doing genetic testing. Take their own heart monitor. There's better types of fat. Try and find a cure for inherited heart muscle diseases. So shared decision making, um, so, it's, so it's something that's come to the fore in the last sort of five or ten years, uh, and, and what is it? So it's, it's basically a process ensuring that individuals are supported to make decisions that are right for you. Um, so, so historically medicine is quite paternalistic, isn't it? You see a doctor and he tells you what to do and you go away. And that's wrong, because the doctor doesn't know what's important for you. So, so it's this whole concept of, uh, of supporting patients to, to make the right choice. And it's a collaborative process. And it brings together the, the medical side's expertise, so they know what works in the trials, what the side effects are, what the risks. But then what the patient knows best, and what the patient knows best is your circumstances, your preference, what's important to you, your values and your beliefs. And the doctor doesn't know that. So you, you've got to bring both of those together to, to help make the right decision for you. So, so that's what um, shared decision making is. And actually, that applies to almost every aspect of medicine. It's not just having an ablation. It's you know whether you take a statin, whether you take the tablet for your blood pressure. So, so that can apply to almost everything in medicine. So it's quite an important process. Um, so, so yeah, it's so irrelevant in any non-life-threatening situation. I think if, if your heart stopped, that's different, isn't it? So, so in the emergency situation, obviously, it doesn't apply. But almost everything else, it does. And I think what's interesting is that individuals and clinicians, so they often overestimate the benefits of treatment and underestimate the harms, and that's across all aspects of medicine. So that's, you know, real world outcomes often aren't as good as sort of specialist trials and things. So, so it's worth just remembering that, I think. Um, and the, these, are, these are cases we, we can read, I think. I'll have to come here to read this. So, so this is, um, yeah, so Catherine, 67, diagnosed with breast cancer, didn't drive, offered this choice between lumpectomy Breast conservation surgery or mastectomy, told an equal survival rate. So, so she's given good influence towards the lumpectomy. Um, but two years later, she got a, a local recurrence and had a mastectomy. And what she didn't know is that with that initial treatment, there was a higher rate of, of local <coughs> recurrence. So she felt had she been given that information, she would have made a, a different choice the first time around. Okay, is that all right? Yes, yeah, that's OK. Okay, and here's Edward. So he's 75, enlarged prostate, troublesome symptoms, offered surgery as the most effective treatment. Um, but he had basically, he had his surgery, and you know, his sex life was really important to him. And one of the common side effects of this type of, of operation is sexual dysfunction, but he hadn't been told that. And he had that after his surgery, and he, he had a miserable time because of it. And he said, you know, that he could have waited, and had he known that, he, he wouldn't have opted for the surgery. So I think they're two little examples of, of where shared decision making hasn't happened and, and has gone wrong. Um, okay, so this is this is where it started, really. So this is um, a book, a theory of medical ethics, by Vetch in 1972. So he had a theory of medical ethics on a this triple contract, so, so having these three phases of, of interacting with patients. Um, so, so I think that's probably when it started. Let me just make my side here. Okay. And then if we look at what's expected for, from all health professionals, so this is embedded in, in the code of what we're meant to do. So, so the GMC is the body that regulates doctors, and it's got a very good document on on how you do share decision-making. 
Um, and then there's this other group that meets quite regularly that, that takes you through you know, how you're meant to approach it. So, so, so there's a lot of documents saying that it has to be done, how you do it, why you should do it. Um, but you know, as a group, do you, do you feel this happens in your interactions with the medical profession? Yeah, do you, yeah, do you think most of the time? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think my experience has been, with, yes, with cardiologists. Okay. Is there anyone that doesn't think it happens? Yeah, do you? Yeah, I've found over the years. Yes, I've, I've, I've found over the years that the cardiologist on the annual or biannual time that you call in to see them just wants to deal with you and move you out and get the next one in as quickly as possible. Um, I've never been offered the opportunity to discuss anything any further with the cardiologist about these types of um, options. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's just in my cardiac center or but, but that's certainly my um, what, what I've what I've noticed in all the years that I've been seeing the uh, that the cardiologist there it's not been any great empowerment at all and I think where, where it often people struggle is when people are running late and clinics are overbooked and yeah there's a, a big waiting room of 30 people and people just want to get people in and out, that, that's when it often falls down, I think. Um. I was just going to add, I think it's becoming a lot better, um, but in the beginning, especially if you are under more than one department in a hospital, or you have um, comorbidities, um, it takes a while before someone takes over responsibility of your care, and when it does happen, then sheer decision making really works. But until then, you're, they're often working in silos and someone's putting your medication up, someone's suggesting you come off it. <laughs> you know, until someone takes overall responsibility, that can be a problem. So in the beginning, not so much, but as you become more in tune with your health and your choices, you can spur them along. <laughs> So, so, so it's a really good point. That, that being under multiple departments is a massive issue because um, no one actually has oversight and ownership. So what you really need is a, a named individual who oversees everything and then asks the opinions for the other. But, but that just doesn't happen most of the time. So, yeah. I, I think all the things that have been mentioned certainly I would relate to. Um, but I think also I'm recognising with the passing years that um, perhaps I'm not helping myself as much because uh, of not taking fully on board that shared responsibility. So I'm thinking about trying to think about the appointment before I get there so that I um, don't get overwhelmed by it and that I can actually think, well, what is important? What do I want to ask? Yeah, and I think that's really important, and we, we heard that in the very first talk this morning, is that it, in a fractured NHS, that, you know, taking control of yourself makes a massive, massive difference. Um, Jerry, could I ask, um, I've sometimes experienced the other problem, where actually I'm really keen to have a recommendation from my doctor, yeah. and I've had a doc I've had found doctors reluctant to actually that they're kind of overplaying <laughs> it's your decision uh, which of course it is but it has to be an informed decision and is there a magic question that will coax out of a doctor uh, you know a, a recommendation yeah no, I, I think yeah I think it does you know it's very dependent on the circumstance in the individual but it's very reasonable you know, it depends on the age of the doctor, but to say, you know, what would you do if this was you or your father or your son or your brother? So I think that's a very reasonable question to ask them. Um, and that doesn't commit you, but that, it just teases out what, what they would do in your position. So I think that's a good question to ask. Actually. Okay, so, so if we go on. Oh, I seem to be having a few problems with the slides, let me go from here, I think. 
Yeah, so this is, this is NHS England's uh, approach to, to shared decision making. So th there's multiple aspects to it. So here you go. So it's preparing the public. It's okay to ask, and I'll take you through. The, there's three or four questions you can ask. So preparing the public. Then you, need, you do need structures in place. Um, so you need commission pathways. You need support. You need people to be trained. Because some of it's intuitive, but a lot of it isn't. So, so you do need a appropriate training. Um, you need these commission services. So what they're more sort of going towards is, is when you have pathways like AF ablation, actually you embed a few things to, to get the money. So you have to have patient reported outcomes. You have to have shared decision making. I think all the things that would make a, a patient's journey you know, beyond just a hard outcome of freedom from AF and things, but bring all the other things into it. So, so this is NHS England's uh, approach to it. And then this is, so, so what do you need to know? So it requires organisational leadership, so, so it can't be an individual, a whole trust, or it'll be ICBs are the, the big things going forward, we'll have to take this on. And it's this collaborative relationship between the patient and the professional and it's a process, so it's not you suddenly turn it on for five minutes. It's got to be a whole process of your whole relationship with them. And patient decision aids, has anyone used any of those? So has anyone had a defibrillator or ablation or angiogram or something? And did you, did you have leaflets or websites or things you could look at? Yeah, things like the British Heart Foundation. So you can go to the... Uh, yeah, but there's, there's actually more tailored and individualized ones you can use, and I, I think that they're, they're actually very useful. Um, and then you've got to discuss risk, benefits, consequences in the context of people's lives and values. So, so you know, if your whole world is, is exercise and you're, you know, an Olympic athlete or something, you know, something that's going to hamper that is very different to someone who's you know, sitting on the settee all day. So, so everyone's individual circumstances are important when you're trying to decide what, what's important. And then so terms such as risk, rare, unusual, common. We, the doctors think that the patients and them are, are saying the same thing, but often, you, you know, what's rare to one person would be one in 10,000, whereas to someone else it'll be one in 10. So, so you've got to be very clear when you're using terms that, that describe risk. And again, there's a whole literature to, to support patients to go through that. Okay, um, so it promotes equity by involving clinicians and, and patients. So it's got to be the best available evidence. That, that's important because, um, you know, you don't want evidence that doesn't include everything, evidence that, that's out of date. And I'll go through some examples of that. Um, so you've got to educate clinicians. You've got to have multidisciplinary teams is often the best way to, to get the recommendations. Trained decision coaches are, are quite useful. And then using the tools, but the tools have to be appropriate for, for literacy and numeracy. So, so a, a decision aided tool is no good if it's a whole lot of medical jargon you, you don't understand. So they've got, to be, they've got to be written for patients. And actually patients should be involved in writing them. It is the best way for, for that to happen actually. And that's, I think that's being done more than it used to be. Um, and, and then if you look at the models, um, there's sort of three components. So it's got to be unbiased medical evidence. You know, in the old days, surgeons would enjoy doing operations and they go, oh, there's hardly any risk. And you know, that, I think those days are, are gone, I hope. So it's got to be clear, factual, unbiased medical evidence. Ideally, from the person or the group at the hospital that are doing it, you don't want the evidence from the perfect trials in the Mayo Clinic where they do millions. You want to know what the the outcomes from your doctor in that hospital are, and I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, it's got to tailor the evidence for individual patients. And then we've got to ask you guys what, actually, what matters to you? Because some people it's living as long as I can, some people it's good quality life as long as I can, some people are still working to be able to pay for the kids to go to university, you know, so everyone has, has different priorities, I think. Um, so if they don't ask you, it's, it's very reasonable for you to bring that up and say, look, what's important to me is, you know, these are the three things that are important to me. Uh, and then this is, um, this is just cognitive versus risk of feelings. 
what often happens is, is everyone thinks they'll think logically and work their way through it. And then suddenly when they're presented with something that carries risk, their feelings flood in and they make a different decision. So it's just saying as, as patients, you need to be conscious of this, this feelings coming in at the point of trying to make a decision around risk. And often it's averse. You suddenly don't want to go through the, the risky <coughs> procedure. So all the logical thinking falls apart when you suddenly uh, you're facing risk. So that, I think that's a real thing. And then in informed consent. So informed consent is really important, but it's different. So informed consent is, is really a bit more of a sort of legal process. So you've, you've reached your decision together, and now we're going to clearly articulate the risks involved, and you're going to sign the consent form. So, so informed consent is really the end of the process. You've made the decision together, and then together you're just going to write down you know, one in 10 people have this, one in 15 people have that, you know, 50% get a good symptomatic benefit. So, so that's the difference between uh, informed consent and, and shared decision making. Um, and you don't need to read this, but, but there is a bit of science, so there are questionnaires and measures that you can give to patients, to clinicians, to both patients and clinicians, where you start to, to actually put a number and a scale on people's perspective, you know, what's important, how risk averse you are, you know, your scale of one to five, do you want to make the decision, do you want the doctor to make the decision, where, where do you, to your point earlier, where do you sit on that scale? So there is scientific questionnaires we can use. Um, and there are various interventions, particular training, particular courses that can improve the, the whole process. And I, I won't go through all of those. Um, so, so these are just some of the sort of simple things. So seek your patient's participation, yeah. help your patient explore and compare the options, you know, assess their values and preferences, reach a decision and then evaluate the decision. So it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward but, but actually doesn't happen a lot of the time. And these decision aids we, we've already talked about, haven't they? But they, they've got to make the decision explicit and they've got to provide information that's relevant to your health status. And they've got to clarify that the personal values for, for them to be useful, really. Um, yeah, and so they should be part of a toolkit. So the, the decision aids have to be up to date. They have to be evidence-based practice. They have to be relevant to the discussion and the decision and the clinical setting. Um, and the, the people who are using it need to know what's in it, be, be happy that what's contained is is relevant to the decision you're making. Um, and I do think that last point doesn't happen, but hospitals and things should, should have a, a repository of these different decision aids that you can, and actually we, we've just gone to an American health system where I work, and there's a great thing called MyChart, if anyone's used that in a system called Epic. But it's brilliant, you can, you can send an email to your doctor, you can access all your letters, all your results, all your x-rays across the thing, you can, access patient information decision aids. So I think that, that will be the future. I think if, if you could have all hospitals with, with one electronic system, that would be even better. But they, as you know, they spent 20 billion trying to do that, which was wasted. Yeah. Okay, and then internet resources. The, the charity is really helpful for these kind of things. Um, and there's other internet resources out there. Okay, um, I'm just gonna start coming to a bit more process and trying to get you guys a little bit involved. So, so if you do this well with, with cardiovascular prevention, people are happier with their medicines, there's better adherence, better long-term outcomes. And you, you, can, you can just Google, so they can just, if you just Google nice patient decision aids, there's loads of things you can read through um, where you can actually, you know, if you know you're gonna see your GP to discuss starting a statin, then, then you know, take control, have a good read through the, the nice stuff about it beforehand. Um, yeah, and, and you know, you'll, you'll get something like this. So all these, should I take a statin? You can click on all these links, understand the pros and cons, and actually get, get involved in the, the decision making. Um, and this, this is, I think this is a good example of where using different things makes a difference. So, so if you if you, I don't know if ever you've been, if you've been to your GPs and they'll do your Q risk, your risk of heart attacks and strokes, 
So it's, it's a common tool GPs use and your health checks and things. So, so what tends to happen is they'll, they'll do it and say your five or 10 year risk of stroke is 9%. We'd only give you a statin if you're over 10%. Oh, fine, I'll go away, that's fine. But if you use a lifelong risk calculator, actually then your lifelong risk over the next 40 years is probably 50, 60%. And there's good evidence that when you look at that lifelong, if you start statins high and early, you dramatically change the lifelong outcomes of people. So, so I think that's a good example of, of being given the whole remit of data to make an informed decision. Because um, if you know you do it now and you know, not much difference in five years, but actually in 30 years, you're 20% less likely to have a stroke, then, then you might make a different decision. So, so I, think that, I think that's a very good example. We've only started doing this probably in the last two or three years for, for cardiovascular risk. A um, little bit about implementation challenges. So you, you, know, you can have a read through all that. You've got to get clinician training, supportive leadership, principles, reimbursement. There's got to be time built in the pathway to, to do this properly. Um, and I, I won't go through that. So, so if, we, if we start to just sort of piece out the pathway a little bit, this is, one, this is probably one of the earlier ones, but you can see choice talk, option talk, decision talk, and then here you have basically decision support. So, so you go through those three or four stages of the process, and each of them has different bits you do in the process. Um, and this is important. You have initial preferences, then informed preferences, because you need to make your decision think about it, understand it, go back, rethink it again. So it's a four or five step process. And again, if, if you look at it a different way, so you seek the participation, help explore and compare the options, benefits and risk, then patients' values and preferences, reach a decision, and then evaluate the decision. So they're, they're the different steps in the whole process. Um, and again, it takes a little bit of time to do that. And some of that you can do when you're not, you're not in the GP surgery or the hospital. Some of that sits, sits with you guys to start sort of reading around and using these, these decision aids. So, so what are we meant to do? So before the appointment, you know, ideally you get access to resources to think about what matters to you and what the various options are. I think having someone with you, do, do you guys take someone with you when you go to? to I do think that's useful. Um, so, yeah, because you, you probably only remember 20% of what's said to you, to be honest. And, um, so, so I think taking someone with you, you know, someone with you, maybe they can write things down. Um, I think it, it is useful. And if it's not a, a partner or a relative, you can have a friend. Uh, and also you can ask the hospital, can they provide someone to come and support you and sit with you? That, that's not an unreasonable thing. Um, so, so, so I think that's before an appointment. So, so during appointment, so you've got to agree an agenda for the conversation. Um, you've got to make sure you understand that you, you can participate as much as you want. You just stop, ask questions. If you're not sure, you've got to say, look, I don't really understand what you're saying about that. You've got to discuss the risks, benefits, and consequences. And I think, you know, we're very good at telling you the risks of doing something. We're not so good at telling you the risks of not doing something. So you do have to understand both sides of the equation. Um, and I think make a record of the discussion, send you the clinic letter written in a way you'll understand it, give you time to go away, think about it, go on the internet, talk to friends, and then come back and rediscuss. So that's, um, do you want a glass of water? That's right. So we, I was trying to think how I could put that into shared decision making, but I don't think I can. <laughs> I could do the temperature of the water. Yeah. Okay. And then following an appointment, so again, resources to help you understand what was discussed and agreed, so a summary, options, links to other resources. Um, yeah. And again, part of that is, is when you're not sure who to contact, how to go through things. Um, and also, you know, additional support for extra help if necessary. 
So, so that, that's what you do after the appointment. And then communicating risk. I, I think this is really important. Um, you know, risk is a bad word, so, so risk is, is perceived as negative. Um, so, so you've got to personalize the information um, and it's got to be relevant to, to you because, you know, I don't know, a risk of an angiogram is 1% if you have a stent. But, you know, if you're 80 with renal failure and bad peripheral vessels, it's much higher than that. If you're 30 uh, with absolute no issues, it's much lower. So that it, we've got to individualize it to, to you when we're giving you the risks. Um, and numbers and pictures. Um, and you've got to, you know, you've got to think. There's a real difference between relative and absolute risk. So, so I think anticoagulation and strokes are a good example of that. So, so, you know, right, if we give you these blood thinners and the blood pressure tablet and the statin, we will halve your risk of stroke. I mean, that sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But if your absolute risk is only 1% and it's going to half a percent, then you're probably not going to bother for a while. So, so that difference between relative and absolute risk is, is really important to get that across. And then you've got to describe it over the period. So, so if it you know, if it cuts your risk over a year, but what happens over 10 years, what happens over 20 years, is there a benefit coming in early? So, so you need to understand all, all those aspects to it, really, I think. And there's some health literacy techniques which, which your doctor should use to understand, you know, how appropriate the language and information is. So, so it's worth getting people to do that, I think. Um, and then when, when you look in decision-making, this is just things. So what are the benefits, risks, alternatives? information uh, and what happens if you do nothing so it's just a nice framework to you know when you're sitting down and making those decisions to, to go through okay and again this is asking questions it, it's okay to ask um, and here you know they've given you the three questions you can ask um, so, so do you you've got a you've got to see it as, as, as an equal opportunity when you go in um, yeah, and I just thought it might be worth just talking through a few little examples. So, again, you know, atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation, um, that's where that relative and absolute risk is, is really important. Uh, and yes, you know, you, if your risk of stroke is small, you're cutting it, that's important. But you're on a tablet that thins the blood, there's a risk of bleeding from the tummy, head injuries. You know, if you go in for an operation and you're still on it, there's a risk. So, so again, you need to understand the, the pros and cons. Um, so, so defibrillators, yeah, I think that's, I think we're better at that because it's a slightly bigger thing to do. But, but there are, you know, there's a lot of risks with defibrillators. There's small risk putting it in, but if you're young, the, the, the risks of leads long term is, is very significant because if you have to extract broken leads, you know, there can be a 1% or 2% mortality when you do that. So long-term leads is an issue, which is why all these subcutaneous ones are coming out. You know, risk of inappropriate shocks. Um, has anyone had a shock? Um, is it painful? So, so I, yeah. Did it feel like being kicked in the chest by a horse? <laughs> so, so I gave this talk once and I said that and, and yeah. someone put the hand up and went I've been kicked in the chest by a horse and had a shock and the shock was worse I've had, so, I've, I've so. had an SI seizure okay. and I've been told that the shock is much more powerful because I don't have leads to my heart uh, I, I know someone that had a shock from both and said it is more powerful yeah, that's interesting um, the third time it happened I sat down on the wall So you're great. I mean, I do have a group of patients that get a bit of post-traumatic stress when they, particularly if you have multiple shocks, and that, uh, and that, yeah. and that is a risk. Um, Anxiety after the yeah. Uh, did, did you find that? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, I had um, one. Thank you. I had uh, one particular episode where I had uh, six shocks in one evening, um, and after that, I was very much on edge with regards to almost anything that I had to do in my day-to-day -day 
job, living, um, for example, I didn't want to go on holiday with the family or the kids. I didn't want to go abroad. I even would get um, nervous on a bus because the, these were in the early days after having the, the sick shocks in, in one night. And after about four years, I was starting to be a little bit more near normal in my thought. I'm usually quite a, a, a logical type of guy, but it took that amount of time of not having any more shocks before I was really confident enough to say, right, we'll go on holiday, but I still made sure that the resort we went to was near a cardiac centre. That was my final, right, I'm going to make sure just in case. Um, obviously, it's, time has moved on a long way since then, and I'm nowhere in that mental mindset, but it was very much uh, the, the top sort of two inches, as they say in rugby, that was leading my life you know it was taking control of everything because that was such a uh, an awful night with those shocks and being told that they didn't really know what what else to do and to leave it to the device I even asked if they could just turn it off because it was so painful and it wasn't appearing to do anything because half an hour or 20 minutes later I was back in another fast rhythm and then getting a shock and they said well no we can't turn it off um, this was in the early stages of 1997 um, and there were only 20 people in the whole of Wales at that time with an ICD. So the local hospital that I was in didn't even have the facility to turn, turn it off if they'd wanted to. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of mental angst and trauma with that, which over, over time um, and then being nice and stable, well medicated, a few lifestyle changes, um, you know, a period of with, with no shocks at all or issues allowed me to get back into a normal lifestyle and a normal way of thinking rather than I don't want that going off again and I need to make sure it doesn't. So, yeah, it, 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 at one point it was probably 90% of my thoughts was the ICD. Over time then that's gone and now I, I don't even think that it's there. I mean, obviously I know that it's there. But, uh, yeah, you just get on with your life. Your, your life is normal, but that was a, a horrendous episode I wouldn't wish on anyone. And the rest of you, if, if you heard that, would that make you less likely to have an ICD? If you heard that one? Not necessarily? No, hopefully not, because yeah, it's life-saving. Many, many years ago, it yeah. saved my life, and I wouldn't be here. I did not put into being, if they'd have been inappropriate shots, so probably <coughs> a different yeah. mindset to that. You know, each one was, was necessary. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Oh, well, thank you for, for sharing that. So, um, I'm conscious of time, so, so I'm going to whiz through this. I'm just going to spend two minutes, and then we'll, we'll hand over and then do all the questions. So, I've covered some of this, um, some of this earlier. So, so, this is just going through a little bit of detail for, for how you get involved in, in your care. Um, so, so, you need to know what symptoms you should be looking out for, and it will be individual. Depends what type of heart muscle problem you have. You need to go know if you get those, how do you get into the system? And that's much harder these days than it used to be. So, so you really need a, a manned, you know, the best, the best way to access a system is a specialist nurse by a long way. If you've got a phone number or an email for a specialist nurse, that's what you want. Consultant secretaries is, is difficult. You know, general phone lines to hospitals are just impossible. So, so try and get a specialist nurse number or email, um, but just find a good way to access the system. Um, you know, you've got to ask about pregnancy, travel, driving, work, vaccines, alcohol, exercise, sex. You know, ask about all those questions, how it's relevant to, to you with your thing. Um, yeah, that's just a bit about. I'll just show this. This is. This just demonstrates where the system goes wrong. Um, this is a patient I saw, um, and I saw them right at the end. So they, they were breathless. They went in and out of A&E four times, got a shot of fruzamide, nothing else, referred to someone, referred to a local hospital back, had an echo, didn't have the result back, repeated it, had a monitor, back to A&E, more bloods, more bloods, back to a &E. had an angiogram, which was always going to be normal, back. And then finally, after a year and a half and 40 episodes, got the cardiomyopathy diagnosis and got the defibrillator. But this is what should have happened. Breathless, appropriate tests, appropriate clinic, 
don't need an angiogram, have your ICD. That should be four weeks and, and six visits. So, so that's where you have the inefficiency in the system at the moment. And, and that's a real case. So that's, and I don't think that's unusual, actually. Um, I mentioned this to those of you in the, the Hokum talk. This is really helpful. You know, have a blood pressure monitor, have an Apple Watch, or, or one of these sort of uh, live core devices. So if you're getting palpitations, you can record it and email it through to, to your doctor. So, so you use technology. I think the technology is much better than it used to be. Um, and yeah, and then, so it's an equal partnership. You know, do everything you can to get the most out of it. Have your letters on your phone or copies of them. Have your ECG on your phone. Have, you know, have all your medicines and the doses. You need the doses as well as the medicines. Um, you know, have letters from other hospitals in particular because we never get the letters from other hospitals. If a test is done, try and get a copy of the results. So have your monitors and your echoes and your blood tests. Um, and before you go in, write down the four or five questions you want to ask, what you want to get out of it. So, so be really proactive. Make the most of, of your time. Um, and, and they're just some other things, you know. You know, what are the trials coming up? What's new? Can I stop any medicines? There's loads of people on diuretics that don't need to be, you know. So, so you know, doctors are very good at starting medicines. They're very bad at stopping them. So, so you know, ask all these questions when you go in. And you, you can have a look through on the slides. I won't go through them all. But you can have a look through, and then there'll be four or five particular to you. So, so you know, just make sure you, you go through all of those. Um, okay, so what we'll do, we'll, we'll hand over, I think. Um, I thought your list uh, there, and sort of about three slides from the end, uh, which was no. saying things about alcohol, sex, and other things. I would have thought that a lot of that should have come through a referral to cardiac rehabilitation, which would have been the provision for all of that, inf or the starting point for all of that information. But of course, certainly if your entry is through an acute admission to hospital, uh, fewer than 20% of people are actually prescribed it. Um, I just, sorry to answer your question before. Um, I think a lot of people will agree that you just get a letter that says review appointment. I think it'd be really useful to have some of the things that will be covered. So I guess these are the tests you'll have when you arrive. This is what we're going to speak about. Um, just to give a bit of a guideline about what you're there to do. I've been to numerous appointments where I haven't seen my consultant. I've just had tests and you kind of bring relatives ready for your big meeting and you get to ask all your questions and then your doctor isn't actually there on the day. I think a brief of what to expect would be really useful. I tell you what, could we just hold off on, on that? We'll come back to you in the main questions. Jane's now set up, I think, <laughs> and ready to go. So Jane Thank Partridge. You. Thank you, Stephen. So my name is Jane Partridge. I'm one of the three Cardiomyopathy UK specialist nurses who work for the charity. Um, so there's Emma, there's myself, and there's Carol. So I'm just going to talk a little bit, um, just following Prof's talk, um, around some um, shared decision-making sort of from, from our charity perspective, really. So obviously, aims would be to help people feel more informed about cardiomyopathy and their treatment options, to help people to feel able to influence their treatment and be in control, so by giving information, advice, guidance and support. Um, so talking through with the specialist nurse, um, so what is cardiomyopathy, talking around medications, talking around possible treatment options. Obviously, we can't make decisions, but we can help you talk about options that you may have been given. So some support for you, so one-to-one -one time to listen as long as it's needed. And we don't have sort of limits on our phone calls, so you can phone, you can talk for 10 minutes, you can talk for half an hour, you can talk for an hour. So you can ask us questions, ask for guidance, ask for advice. We've also got live chat, so that sits on the front of our website. So you can ask a question. Um, they're usually good for sort of quick responses if you're at work and you think, oh, I really need to ask this, then jump on live chat. Or one-to-one -one Zoom, you know, they can also be offered. Um, so the nurses work half eight to half four, Monday to Friday. So if you wanted to arrange a Zoom call with us to have a face-to-face -face conversation, then we can look to arrange that for you. 
Um, Support-wise, the nurses offer online nurse-hosted support groups. We also do nurse webinars, so some of those will be on our YouTube channel, where we talk around empowerment, around um, uh, you know, decision-making and how to get the best from your appointments. Um, we also offer, as a charity, regional in-person support groups, so you can go along to your local support group. Um, we also offer advice and guidance on living with cardiomyopathy, on aspects of lifestyle, exercise, that is general information. Obviously, we can't offer specific information. That would come from your cardiac specialist team. We can talk around genetic testing and preparing for your cardiologist and cardiac nurse appointment, as Prof has just mentioned. So preparation sometimes can be really important um, so that you know what to expect, what sort of questions you might want to ask. And obviously that will be individualised to each person. So many people diagnosed with a long-term condition can feel they're disempowered and almost resigned to the possibility they have to accept a loss of control. Many decisions about healthcare are a fine balancing act. The ideal is patient choice with guidance from an expert professional, so a cardiologist in a specialist centre, ideally. Explore the potential benefits, as Prof said, or you know, drawbacks of different treatments, and that is part of shared decision making. Understanding can take time, which in healthcare can sometimes be in short supply. Medical terminology, abbreviations and jargon, for a patient this can be a barrier to clear communication and reasoning. And sometimes it can seem like patients and professionals are almost speaking a different language. Reading medical reports where Google might be used to interpret medical words such as ejection fraction or hypertrophy may sometimes not reflect the actual circumstances of that report. So, there's certainly an example that um, I'd give for someone saying in their clinical letter, no evidence of hypertrophy, but hypertrophy was searched, and then they were worried that they had hypertrophy that they'd Googled. So again, looking at the context of how it's been written, certainly our specialist nurses can help with that. And that can cause a great deal of anxiety and even panic for some people, and that's very understandable. Also, social media interpretation by uploading reports for patient groups, asking lay and well-intentioned people to provide their opinion and prognosis when only a small percentage of this information will likely be correct. And shared decision-making by making an informed person knowing your options, starting with understanding and having an open dialogue where choice is clearly discussed and our nurse team can support you with information, advice and guidance. And we're ideally placed to support in navigating you and helping you through your journey um, with cardiomyopathy. And we can provide longer term support, so a key element in increasing understanding. We're here you know, for you if you want to come back to us, if you've got an initial question. It could be months, it could be weeks, it could be years. But we're here for you to listen and to help your, support you. And shared decision-making is an important aspect of empowerment and today's conference title, helping regain a feeling of trust and control. And this quotation is from one of our trustees, Libby Jarman. And so information is fundamental to the process of patient empowerment. An informed, educated patient is an empowered one. And patients make the best decisions when they are given the right information. To make genuinely informed decisions about our treatment, we must have access to the relevant information needed to make those, in to make those decisions. And being informed is a key to empowerment for many people. A transferring of knowledge to patients about their condition, medication and treatment. So why is a medication needed? What does it do? Why am I taking it? Those are important questions that we can help you. And the transfer of knowledge is crucial. At first point of contact with the patient, education on how, why, what, where and when in relation to a condition should be talked through. And we've got information resources and we have our website. And an empowered patient is confident in their ability to manage their condition along with their clinicians. And when unsure about where to go or what to do next, we can help guide you and advise you. And this quotation is from the World Health Organization from 1998. 
And here we have information resources led by our cardiomyopathy community. So we have a newly formed symptom diary, which is available um, at the back. Um, so that's been changed um, to reflect the needs of our community. And then we have YouTube. So those of you who have come to the conference today, those sessions that you weren't able to see in person, they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, these videos will be there. And again, part of empowerment to be able to watch those. And who are our nurse team? So come and say hello. We're on stand eight. Um, so there's Emma, there's Carol, and there's myself in the background. And we've also got a quiet room if you want to come and chat to one of us. We are here for you. And also, just to let you know that we are undertaking a cardiomyopathy research question project. Um, so there's still time to have your say on the future research priorities within cardiomyopathy. So please respond to our second survey. And there should be information around that. There's QR codes if you can scan that and have your say on what you'd like the future research questions to be. Thank you. Jane, thank you very much. So if we could go straight into questions, and I promised the gentleman along here that he would have the first question. Thank you. Jerry, a question for you. Um, you asked if there's anything you could do for us as... Um, kind of wealthy people. Um, probably not the greatest part to ask the question or, or make a comment, but what I think we need to do is to forge, you need to forge some sort of link between the patient and the and Cardiomyopathy UK. It's been my bugbear as um, running a group in Bristol that 95% of the people we have in our group all had diagnosis and they were just sort of... Uh, the bell was hit next, and off they went out into the car park. And there's no link in Bristol between the professionals and the, uh, the charity. And to be told uh, you've got a, a condition that initially is uh, to the first thing in your head, it's life-threatening, and then find yourself out in the car park and not know where to go, then it's, uh, it's <laughs> just very confusing. It's no, so, so a re really good point. So we, we were trialling... And we've got a, COVID hit everything, didn't it? We were trialling having Cardamoff the UK in our outpatients mm. clinics. So you, you'd have the discussion diagnosis and then the room across that be Cardamoff the UK with a yeah. cup of tea. And I think they've done it in Birmingham with Will. And I think there's yeah. a few. So, so I think that's a nice model. The other thing I wonder is whether with our clinic letters, we, we have a sort of link to Cardamoff at the bottom of the clinic letters or a little leaflet. Um, <coughs> That might be, but but really important question. We could maybe, because that's something we we could do nationally. Just have yeah. a link at bottom of letters. I think we're already doing that in Newcastle. Oh, the yeah. Newcastle support group have arranged with the Newcastle hospitals for the hospital letters <laughs> to go out with the kind of the UK logo on, and that's something which might yeah. well be picked be up. Uh, so, more, so, more so what broadly. we should do is, is maybe a little bit better share best practice with all the. Sort of yeah. groups of clinicians yeah. around the country. So, yeah. a very good point. Um, yeah. On that one, Admiral, just uh, excuse me a second. Um, we, we've got a table inside the Bristol Heart Institute, so that's a match with the staff where we talk to patients who have been diagnosed that day, that minute, yeah. on their way out to the farm park, and we're there. Um, we've approached Sophie. So that's where a bit of yeah, I think that's where a bit of peer pressure comes in, doesn't it? It's not so much a question; it's sort of half a comment on the question that was here, which is: I have manned um, cardiomyopathy stands at um, the British Society of Heart Failure. And the most enthusiastic gatherers of the information that the Cardiomyopathy UK provides are actually the specialist nurses. And as you indicated earlier on, I think they are 
a wonderful resource for people such as ourselves. So, of course, it doesn't help the person who's had the diagnosis and been sent out into the car park, in your case, um, but certainly if they have a referral to a specialist nurse, then these... So if there are vehicles to reach the specialist nurses, I think that's a very good way of distributing the... Um, the awareness of Cardiomotor UK as a service. So, so to Jerry, get, uh, come sorry. back on that, because that's, you know, heart failure nurses are fantastic. They're the best resource we have, but, but they deal with, with heart failure. So, so there's a bit of overlap with dilated cardiomyopathy. They don't see people with hypertrophic restrictive cardiomyopathy. And we have very few genetics nurses, and they're mainly focused around genetic testing. So there's a real gap there. And, you know, if we could get... You know, similar to the heart failure nurses, community cardiomyopathy nurses. I mean, that would be fantastic. Um, but I don't know where we get the funding to do that. But, but it's a great idea. Jerry, can I ask you a question from the app, yeah. which is linked to the difference between treatment or care in a district general hospital cardiology department <laughs> and a tertiary or specialist centre? Um, so, so you may have how do one we, of my bugbears there. Actually. How do we get a referral from our district hospital when we're not necessarily getting the sort of shared treatment that we're after to a specialist centre? So, so, you know, if you, you cannot have everyone managed in specialist centres, nor should you, um, because then it'll be a three-year wait for your next appointment and you'll be rushed in an hour. So, so the only workable model, because we're seeing more and more people because of genetic testing, family screening, that the numbers are impossible to manage in the big centres. So, so you need functioning hub-and-spoke networks, um, but they've got to work well. You've got to have local people with expertise. You've got to have local specialist nurses. You've got to have MDTs that everyone dials into. So there's a national service specification going through the RCRG, which is our national body that we were looking at two days ago. And I think we're going to try and build on the ACHD model. Because if you look at adult congenital heart disease, it's probably a quarter of the numbers, but they have really good functioning hub and spokes, clear description of governance within all the spoke hospitals, coordinators, specialist nurses. I think that's the model we need going forward. Yeah, And then that frees up the specialist centres. So if you're in a spoke and you've got tricky to manage obstruction, you can get seen in the specialist centre in three or four weeks. So, so I think that's what we have to do. And that's, I think that's our biggest challenge going forward, actually. So I'm glad you asked that. Thank you very much. Um, do you agree? Final question, and then we just break for lunch. Okay. Can I just ask one quick question to, to Jane? So, so <laughs> we, we, th th there's lots about how the charity and everyone supports you, but how, how do people support the charity? Do, do you want to answer that? Because yeah. no one seems to ask that, but the charity does need help and support and time, finance, all the other things. So how, how do people do that? Yeah, so we've got a change maker programme um, and we have volunteers for the change maker programme, so they'll go out there um, and they will talk to, to public bodies to, you know, um, find out about what the people within the cardiomyopathy community are looking at, what they're interested in, and they will go out and talk to the policy makers and talk about what matters to you as people with cardiomyopathy. We also have volunteers that run our support groups, so in-person support groups, um, and those are very important aspect. Um, and obviously fundraising, you know, is, is massively important for us. Um, but it's, you know, it's changing the picture of cardiomyopathy care, and so, you know, the research project, again, is really important in that aspect. Right, thank you. As a top man, heart man, have you heard of and what's your opinion on the stem cell treatment at Barts? I mean, it's, it's a clinical trial. I mean, we've been talking about stem cells for, for 20 years now, um, and I'm still yet to see concrete evidence it's working. Whereas I think the... Um, I did in five years ago. Yeah. In five years ago, I'm from here. And yeah. I've got a full-time physical yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it still sits in the the clinical trials arena. Um, would, you, would you send someone if, if you thought they were under the line? Would you send someone there for so, so I think it's a clinical trial. So, so I'd, I'm very happy to send people to have that discussion. But 
that people need to understand in a clinical trial you can get better, worse, or stay the same. You know, there is no evidence that it works. Um, you know, same with the gene therapy that's starting. It's uh, you've got to realise that there are downsides as well as upsides. And a lot of this stuff, what we don't know is the longer term outcomes of a lot of this. Um, so, so, you know, at a basic level in animals, there's, there's evidence, but there's, I haven't seen good evidence in humans, which is why they're, they're doing the trials. Um, but I'm sure in five, ten years, that and the genetic editing will, will be there. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, there are leaflets at the back there, and uh, Jerry asked, what can you do? I, it's pretty obvious already that we've got a number of people in the audience who are already doing a great deal in terms of uh, advocacy and working with newly diagnosed patients and so on. So perhaps as well as challenging you, we can also thank you for what you are doing at the moment.